Hello and welcome, welcome everybody. My name is Anelena Gonzalez Treviño from the Center for Mexican Studies, uh, of the National Autonomous University of Mexico in the United Kingdom. And it is a great pleasure for me to celebrate International Women's Day today with uh, a, a wonderful talk by a very dear friend and colleague, Dr. Monica Stenbock, who is going to talk about uh, the importance of feminine cosmology in a way in pre-Hispanic Mexico. So I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Monica Stenbock. Uh, first of all, welcome Monica. And um, she was born in Mexico City. She graduated in art history from the Instituto de Cultura Superior with the thesis, Flower and Song as a Movement in the Aztec Worldview. Later, she obtained a master's degree in comparative literature with the thesis, Myth, History, and Literature, the Phenomenon of the Nibelungs from German literature, and a PhD in comparative literature also at UNAM with a thesis about chances and misfortunes of the romantic myths, Ocean and the Nibelungs as repositories of a new aesthetics. Since 2007, she has worked as a lecturer in the Department of Modern Languages and Literature at UNAM's Faculty of Philosophy and Letters. Uh, and uh, among the many subjects that she has taught, we can mention those addressing specific eras in German literary history, as well as seminars related to her personal interests related to mythical phenomena and their poetic manifestations. Among her publications, we had can mention of myths and fairy tales in the Anuario de Letras Modernas uh, of the Faculty of Philosophy and Letters, and the Nibelungs, a national, nationalistic uh, mythical phenomenon in myth and romanticism hermeneutics notebooks. Additionally, she has taken part in symposia roundtables and has given conferences both in Mexico and abroad. Um, and she is very knowledgeable, even though she, she does research on uh, Germanistics, she is very no knowledgeable about pre-Hispanic Mexico. And so we, we're very proud to have you here with us, uh, Monica. It's over to you. Thank you, Annalena. I want to thank everybody, you and your staff especially, for this opportunity. And uh, I'm very happy to share this day, Dia de la Mujer, Women's Day today, with this uh, subject called Ispapalotl, which is a, a, a conference I have prepared. I'm going to share my screen so you can get a glimpse at the PowerPoint. Just a minute. Oops. Okay. Can, can you see the screen? Yeah, but you need to go to the screen mode. Then uh -huh. I saw, yeah, there we go. Okay. That's perfect. Then, Thank you, Monica. Okay. Uh, I'm going to just jump into, subject, into the subject. And so we have a little more time later on for questions. Okay. Uh, this conference is uh, named Is Papalotl, the Obsidian Butterfly and Nawa Cosmic Movement in uh, Feminine Myths and Symbols of the Pre Hispanic Culture. Let me see if I can. Can you see the whole screen? Because I have a problem with my, just a minute. No, it's fine. We can see it very well. Thank you. Yeah? OK. Yeah. OK, then uh, I, I'm going to start. It's Papalot. One of the main clues to accessing the nature of what we call human is the presence of parallel worlds, not supported by material consideration and linked to both the collective and the individual imaginary that guarantee cultural continuity. We conceive this continuity as exclusively human because it includes the possibility of creating references and guidelines that are necessary to help us find our place within the universe and make our lives meaningful. It is through intangibles like names, images, and visions that we shape our stories, structure our realities, and establish values that control our lives. These intangibles are not only responsible for our relationships with each other, but they also open the door to what we call the sphere of the sacred, 
in which we find spiritual support and derive our theological certainties. This phenomenon is universal and be, can be found in any culture we know. However, parallel realities tend to be heterogeneous and plural, and the generated identities rarely complement each other, but enter into conflict, question religious beliefs and traditions, and provoke power struggles that often end up destroying different identities or subjecting them to the prevailing power dynamics. So we have here a couple of images that show um, um, connections with, with feminine and female, and they are all different. And usually we don't uh, like our female identities to be questioned by other cultures. So that is what I'm trying to say. Based on this premises, I want to approach the terrifying cultural shock that took place during the Spanish conquest of Mexico and the impact it had on pre Hispanic identities that did not disappear, but were integrated into our current collective memory. Let us leave aside the horrors of war and the epidemic diseases that marked the 16th and part of the 17th centuries and concentrate on the realm of the metaphysical and the intangible to address the mythic symbolic domain of what we conceive as female or feminine, both within the Christian and the pre-Hispanic worlds. I find it impossible to address pre-Hispanic thinking in a realistic and objective way, because in addition to the passing of time, I cannot avoid my own identity or the historical events that define and mark my feelings. For instance, I myself am female and Catholic, and consequently my mental structure, my imaginary, and my religious references will always prevent me from having an unprejudiced view of a cosmogony that I am not familiar with. Nevertheless, I will try to stretch my vision to get at least a glimpse of a divergent way of thinking that allowed other human beings to find a meaning in life that endured in time for at least 6,000 years. What I'm trying to say is that this talk is based on an imaginary idea of what the pre-Hispanic cosmogony might have been since I believe we cannot reconstruct the past as it once was. I have to give some ontological guidelines so we don't get lost and uh, we get like the main reference so I can make my point. Ontological guidelines. European metaphysics and philosophies are strongly influenced by ancient Greek thinkers. The Aristotelian concept of being, for instance, is conceived as an indivisible entity, which is eternal and immovable. This entity, known as the Aristotelian one, is the basis of our logical thinking and the principle of non-contradiction, according to which we organize time and space, which enables us to quantify the universe. Thus, for example, the quantity three is defined as three times one. Half is defined as half of one. To question the entity of one will inevitably threaten our identity, since one is the equivalent of being. Going against the Aristotelian one will confront us with not being, which is something we cannot imagine. It would mean that our first reference point would be a zero. That is something non-existent. However, there is a strong possibility that the concept of Aristotelian one did not have this position in pre-Hispanic thought, given that the origin of the universe in this thought is identified as two. In this case, two is not conceived as two times one, but as a continuity and a presence in pre-Hispanic mythology. 
It has many different names, but unfortunately, we're not able to identify whether these names refer to a single ontological presence or to different dual manifestations responsible for creating pre-Hispanic image and cosmos. Miguel Leon Portilla, one of the most renowned pre-Hispanic specialists, interprets this, interprets this duality as one numerical entity that contains both feminine and masculine principles. This is so because it's very difficult for a Catholic monotheist educated by priests to question the unity of God and because the Aristotelian one functions as an ontological certainty in Western Europe. In his book, La Filosofia Nahuatl, Leon Portilla makes a count of diverse names linked to this duality that can be found in documents belonging to the 16th century. Here I have some uh, examples and I translated a few. We can name this duality as Ometeotl and Ometecutli, Lord and Lady of Two. Tonacatecutli and Tonacihuatl, Lord and Lady of Destiny. Tona and Tota Huehueteotl, mother and father of the ancient god. Sitlaltonic and Sitlalique, the one who makes things shine and the one with the skirt of stars. Chalchiutonac and Chalchiutlique, lord of the precious water and the jade sunshine and lady with the skirt of jade beads. Now, regardless of whether this duality is interpreted as a unity, or as an independent dual principles, or as an unfolding key intuition, we can see that unlike Christian views of in this regard, there is no dominant masculine or feminine principle. Here, the distinguishing between uh, male and female, male and female has no hierarchy, but it is defined by a limit or a gray zone that avoids the uh, that avoids the inherent polarity of these principles male and female lose their identity and become part of the undefined as you can see i have a symbol in the center of this uh, image it's called olin and it's a representation of the uh, center of the world and these are the complementary opposites and the key uh, place is obviously the center, and the center is a void. You can, I think you can see it there. Okay, uh, let me retake. Uh, male and female lose their identity and become part of the undefined, and it is the undefined that takes the position of the first point of reference which is equivalent to the Aristotelian one. Neither masculine nor feminine, but the void or hollow space is that one that enables them to be different, will establish itself as the basic support of the universe. Even if this void or hollow space is related to the lack of existence, it cannot be imagined as an ontological absence a lack of being, since it must be understood as the potentiality of the possible. Now our cultural manifests this key intuition referring to the umbilic umbilicus of creation or the navel of the universe and imagine it as a magical mirror that not only reflects the world of the sensitive, but embodies the potential of anything that is possible. This myth owns all images it might reflect, but cannot hold onto any of them. Furthermore, if we consider the concept of duality, one mirror placed in front of another mirror opens to infinity, exposing us to the dangers of narcissistic solipsism. But this does not happen because a magical mirror in pre-Hispanic culture has been damaged by a sacred knife called tecpatl, 
the same knife used to perform human sacrifice. The sacred knife, here we have some images of uh, two uh, different uh, pre-Hispanic mirrors. And in the center, I have an image of a um, an cosmic hole. And I think there is a similarity. So uh, we have uh, this idea of, of, of hollow space or of a vac vacuum that for us is like uh, a little difficult uh, to imagine. And it's kind of terrifying because you cannot start something with something that we consider that is not there or it's, it's not a bee. Okay. The sacred knife, Tekpat, refers to the duality since here's the Tekpatl, it's the same uh, material used as in the mirrors. And uh, as I said, the sacred knife refers to a duality since it is a double-edged tool and is endowed with a life of its own. It can be portrayed in a two-color representation, usually half white and half red, which marks a symbolic connection to the pre-Hispanic culture concept which can be translated as burned water and refers to the sacred and most important element of life, blood. It, is all, it also invokes the duality of creation. The Aztecs believed the world was created thanks to two elements, water and fire, originating in a cleavage caused by the sacred knife, complementary opposites linked to the origin. Tek Patl is a creation itself, since its ability to cut and, and uh, to cut creates the possibility of inwardness and intimacy crucial for the sense of female or femininity in the pre-Hispanic imaginary. There is no way of creating a repository without a space that has been hollowed out. Concave places enable us to plant seeds, to provide the necessary space for them to grow. The female uterus is such a space, but the word uterus in this context is not confined to the human body or its genitality. It encompasses the cosmic void of what has not been defined, transmuting itself thereby into the matrix of creation itself. Thus, Tekpatl, the sacrificial knife, cannot be reduced to a phallus or a phallic symbol, since it embodies the possibility of marking limits and creating the boundaries needed to mark up a differentiated and plural universe. For example, we can recognize a sacrificial knife in the iconography, in the iconography captured so uh, in the so-called Aztec calendar, I think everybody knows this stone, or sunstone, taking the place of the tongue of the face of Tonatiu, which is the image in the center of the sculpture. This will link the knife to the faculty of speech and naming, opening a large field of interpretative regard, uh, readings. It is important to note that pre-Hispanic deities are not thought of as independent divinities with fixed features. They are conceived as a metaphysical energy that many times shows itself through details and do not need, does not need all the attributes that are attached to it. The fact that these deities do not have precise images makes them versatile. They are meant to invoke, evoke, and channel energies through what we call symbolic nodes. Symbolic convergences, which are responsible for the context in which they interact or even merge together. Okay, are we fine? Somebody wants to make a question, we can open a little space. Not yet, Monica, thank you. Not yet? So we are going to continue, okay? 
myths and symbols of the feminine. A word or an image is symbolic when it contains more than what is perceived at first glance, wrote C.G. Young. According to this definition, no one can escape the world of the symbolic. And J. Chavalier wrote, it is not that we live within a world of symbols, but a world of symbols lives within us. Symbols depend on their context to acquire accurate meanings. They cannot be isolated. This is especially true for pre-Hispanic imaginary, since it is ruled by the phenomenon of Olin movement, which is considered to be the heart of the universe. The combination of movement, Olin, and heart, Yolotl, stands uh, uh, in Yolotl, Olin Yolitsli, stands in marked contrast with the equivalence in the Western world. Instead of movement, we conceive the center of the universe as permanent and eternal, and immovable toehold capable of endorsing our ontological continuity. This is not the case in pre-Hispanic cosmogony, since movement is fully identified with life, and ontological persistence is endorsed by change. The guarantee of continuity is life itself. Paradoxically for us, the, prevalent, the prevalence of the ephemeral is the source of stability. There is an impressive monumental sculpture in the National Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City called Yolotlicue, the third of hearts. We have it on the left side which bears great iconographic resemblance to the neighboring sculpture Cuatlicui, the lady with the skirts made out of serpents. Despite being very similar, these two sculptures address different symbolic nodes and establish different meanings. Etymologically speaking, they share the same noun, Cuatl, skirt, but their names are preceded by different images, Yolotl heart and Cuatl serpent creating distinct symbolic context and changing their precise poetic and religious meanings. This is precisely what happens with every Aztec deity. It is also the reason why every female goddess in pre-Hispanic iconography is linked to the act of creation and to the primal goddesses. All of them belong to a vast network of contexts that allow them both to move and reinvent themselves, paying tribute to the Olin, the heart and navel of the universe. To give an example of what I have stated before, I have chosen one of the fem feminine deities called Ipspapalotl, obsidian butterfly. We can find her image in the one uh, in one of the codices of the 16th century called Codice Borbonic. There, she is shown as a woman with wings of a butterfly made out of many sacrificial knives. This deity belongs to the mythical corpus of the Toltec Chichimecan people who inhabited what is now the southern part of the United States and the northern part of Mexico. She has been portrayed in different ways and is consistently linked to a particular night butterfly that is native to Mexico. The scientific name is Rochilda Orizaba, but people in Mexico call, call this butterfly La Mariposa de los Cuatro Espejos, the butterfly of the four mirrors. Unfortunately, this species is on the verge of extinction. Butterflies in general, are the quintessential example of cosmic rebirth, since the many changes these insects undergo show how discontinuities can be overcome. From an egg to a larva, from a larva to a cocoon, to a butterfly. Transferred to pre-Hispanic imaginary, the metamorphosis butterflies undergo are interpreted as deaths and births in accordance with the principle of Olin life or movement. If you die, you must disappear into a vacuum or void, the matrix of creation, 
and the sole possibility of ontological continuity, death and birth, are linked to violence. The egg must break for the larva to hatch. The larva spins its own uterus, the cocoon, which must be broken for the butterfly to emerge. On the metaphorical level, this butterfly unfolds in a duality, two wings that contain four mirrors. This is how pre-Hispanic cultures conceived the birth of space and time. Each papalotl is associated with the void and with the forces of darkness, and thus terrified Christian priests, monks, and missionaries. They describe this deity as an awful monster that was thrown out of the Tamwanchan. Tamwanchan is uh, the place of the unborn, often interpreted by Christians as an equivalent to the Garden of Eden. This is why the testimonies and legends surrounding its papalotl are linked to evil. They cannot escape the Manichaean Christian dynamic where expulsion from paradise is a divine punishment and not, as in pre-Hispanic thought, a blessing that allows the miracle of life and gives continuity to all. The portrayal of this papalotl is terrifying, so terrifying that some of the most important friars responsible for collecting pre-Hispanic stories and legends like Duran and Sagun decided to ignore her. However, she is the main protagonist in two document te documented texts that belong to the Annales de Cuautitlán. It is very difficult for us to decipher these texts adequately because we are unable to reconstruct the context inherent to the symbolic notes. But what we know from the Leyenda de los Soles, Legends of the Sun, is that Ispapalotl exists prior to the creation of the universe. She is therefore a co-creator of an ancestral time and space that are needed to support a mythological narrative. In El Pensamiento Nahuatl Cifrado por los Calendarios, Nahuatl thoughts as encoded in its calendars, Loret Sejourné, a specialist, in pre-Hispanic iconography, records following stories. A yellow eagle, a yellow tiger, a yellow snake, a yellow rabbit, and a yellow deer shoot with a bow through Huitzilan <clears throat> among the southern thorns. In Huitzinalapan, the soil without thorns. In Amilpan, the irrigated fields. And in Xochitlampan, the flower. You will shoot a red eagle, a red tiger, a red snake, a red rabbit, and a red deer. And when you draw the bow again, put them in the hands of Xiuticutli, the lord of the year and the fire, Wewetéot, the ancient god, who will be guarded by three, Miscoatl, Tospan, and Iwitl. These are the names of the three stones of our home. This is how it's Papalotl, the razor butterfly instructed the Chichimecans. There's another story, and it says the following. The gods, lords of the year, went and fetched the woman its papalotl. Mimich was guiding. As soon as she was brought forth, they burned her, and she exploded several times. The sky blue flint was the first one to appear. The second explosion, the white flint sprouted. They took the white flint and wrapped it in a blanket. The third time, the yellow flint sprouted. They did not take it, they just saw it. The fourth time, the red flint sprouted. They did not take it either. Miss Coatl worshipped the white flint as a god, which they wrapped in the bundle. He carried him on his back and went to fight to a place named Komala. He was carrying his flint god named Ispapalotl. <coughs> the symbological notes in these texts are very complex. There are animals, colors, places, names of deities, heroes, and they relate to one another and to other texts 
we might not know it all. It is thus impossible to fully establish intertextualities. Let us focus only on the issue regarding the creation of time and space. For instance, the first text mentioned the deity Shutekutli and Wewateot. Both are found in the center of the universe, the navel of the world, and they are described in the following poem. Mother of the gods, father of the gods, lying on the navel of the earth, inside the turquoise pyramid, crouched in the clouds in the ever blue sky, like the water, like the turquoise bird, old god, Misty Miklan Shutekutli. The archeologist Eduardo Matos Moctezuma describes a ritual in honor of Shutekutli as follows. The god had a temple called Son Moloko, dedicated to him, it, in which Sagun describes how four slaves were sacrificed. They were dressed like the image of the deity and decorated with the colors that marked the different directions of the universe. Another story begins with deity of time and fire, Wewetheotl, that decides to burn Iztapalotl and she also explodes four times, creating new navels of the universe. This time described with attributes, colors, and reference to space and time that are well-defined. This indicates that the offspring of his papalotl, sacrificial knives, are responsible for the creation of cosmic space and cosmic time. Mythical tales are never univocal and linear. They cluster around certain key motives that are definable. Hans Blumenberg, a specialist in mythology, compares mythical stories and events with musical symphonies that have a theme or leitmotif and variations. For this reason, we find sacrificial knives as key elements in many texts from the 16th century. For instance, Fray Bernardino de Sagún offers the, follow the following chronicle. And they also say that she carried a cradle on her back, like someone carrying her child. And she would go to the market and mingle among women. Then she would disappear, leaving the cradle behind. When the other women noticed that the forgotten cradle was there, they looked inside and found a flint knife, like a spear-like iron, which they used to kill those they sacrificed. And so they understood that it was Siwakoatl who left the knife there. And then another uh, story, this time recorded by Diego de Duran, we have this version. This Indian woman took her cradle and entered the market and went to the most important merchant, the jeweler. There, she put the cradle down and begged the merchant to look after it until her return. The jeweler took care of the cradle and the Indian woman left and did not return. As the merchant realized that she was taking a long time to come back and that it was time to go home, and that having not nursed all day, the child did not cry or scream. She unwrapped the bundle and found a sacrificial knife and understood that this was the son of Siwakot. Lorette Sejourné is convinced that Fray Bernardino de Sahun conceives the deity Siwakoatl as an original female goddess of the pre-Hispanic cosmos and argues that because he tried to avoid mentioning Iztapalotl because she's so terrifying, she uh, is an equivalent of the obsidian butterfly. Since in other versions of this myth, Iztapalotl is clearly the first female pre-Hispanic deity. For instance, there is a version in which Ometek Siwatl gives birth to a flint knife that is dropped and falls onto a place called Chimcomostoc, a mythical geographic reference to the northern home of the Chichimecas. When it touches ground, the knife explodes into four knife-shaped pieces that later become the four cardinal points of the universe and define colors and symbols of their own. Here we have uh, images of the four cardinal points, uh, which is very interesting. 
because each cardinal point has a color attached to it and has certain times attached to it. The four cardinal points are often referred to as Tezcatlipoca, smoking mirrors, and coincide with the ontological void. Sihuacoatl, Omezihuatl, and Ispapanotl are three of the, all three of them are mothers of flint knives or navels of the universe with their own particular identities and symbolic meanings, which include geographical references, certain times of the year, emblems, colors, and many other elements. It is the interrelation between navels of the universe and their symbols that create both <clears throat> mythical and everyday realities and define the rhythm of cosmic evolution. Okay, mythical stories related to Ispapalatl are very complex. Most of them are simply incomprehensible to us. The anthropologist Baby Merari Hernandez Celis has analyzed one of the most emblematic sculptures that portray the goddess of Ispapalotl from an iconographic point of view. This sculpture, known as El Altar de Ispapalotl, the altar of Ispapalotl, is at the Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City. We can describe it as a monolithic trapezoid stone with ornamental relief, reliefs. <clears throat> Archaeologists believe that in men, and it may actually be an architectural element since it is it's different in shape and size to other sacrificial stones. Hernandez Eli suggests that the sculpture has something to do with the word Nahuatl Ixitla, which means expression, representation, personification, or embodiment of the sacred. She points out that pre-Hispanic deities do not manifest themselves through fixed iconographic images, but must be conceived as cosmic potentialities that reveal themselves through a kind of iconographic braid with multiple meanings. From the etymological point of view, Ixipla is linked to the term sheep or xip, which means skin, covering, or shell, so that it could mean a container of sacredness. Containers of sacredness allow numinous forces to convey their power to those who enter into contact with them. This is true for many items, especially for clothing and jewelry, <clears throat> and also for colors, since pre-Hispanic cultures believe that they harbor metaphysical powers, clothing and attire, are therefore regulated by pre-Hispanic religious authorities. People could not dress as they wanted because clothes were considered liturgical garments that have the power to link a person to specific metaphysical energies. This is the reason why the Huipil, traditional pre-Hispanic dress we can see today, no matter how beautiful, is not related to fashion but deeply rooted in religious beliefs. There are several representations of Ispapalotl attire. The Codice Borbonico shows her wearing not butterfly, but eagle wings, a short skirt that shows her human knees and legs that end not in human foot, but in eagle claws. The skirt has diagonal stripes and ends with a skirting board ornamented with sacrificial knives with red tips. This is a clear reference to blood. Religious and rituals and daily life in daily life were intertwined with in pre Hispanic America, since the rhythm of everyday life was marked by mythological happenings and beliefs. Ispapalo and her flint knives were invoked in every child since they treat the baby from the umbilical cord, thus enabling him or her to be a new and independent origin. The same is true for each person who died. Each origin intrinsically carries its own death, meaning that the person will return to the ontological void conceived as a magical mirror 
that nurtures the creation of new origins that will be cut by Ispapalotl's knives. This is also why in some stories, Ispapalotl uh, opens the entrance to the underworld and swallows her own children, transforming death into life again. Symbols and myths play an important role in, Aztec, in, the, uh, role in the Aztecs, becoming the centralized oligarchy, Spanish, so the centralized oligarchy Spanish soldiers encountered in the 16th century. And many of the power dynamics and institutions in Aztec society derived their strength from sacred objects and rituals. It was common for priests to use symbolic elements related to Spapalotl to invoke energies considered female. Even if certain garments are conceived as specifically feminine or female, they do not have to be worn by women. During religious ceremony, female forces were often embodied by men, since Aztec women were basically, basically confined to domestic tasks. Despite the existence of priestesses, it was largely men who exercised political and religious power. Women were responsible for housekeeping and raising children during the first years. They were not allowed to go to war and only had access to the Tonatiu Glan, place reserved for warriors in the afterlife if they died during childbirth, as it was believed that they had crossed the threshold into the afterlife fighting with their own born child. This demonstrates that there was no gender equality, not even after death. The entry into the different afterworlds of paradise in the Aztec society was not linked to questions of morality, but rather to the way in which the person died. Despite being the recipient who makes conception possible, women did not play a key role in religious ceremonies. Rather, men empowered as female deities used clothing, jewelry, and other objects related to the realm of the female. Although, the female and the feminine condition play an important role in pre-Hispanic cosmogonies. The social position of women in everyday life was not good at all. We know that mythical imaginaries can articulate realities, but realities do not have the same power over myths. The condition of masculine and feminine are mere possibilities that derive their meaning from parallel worlds which involve symbols and context. Therefore, they can never be taken literally. Established power dynamics tend to embrace myths and symbols and interpret them as their own, to their own convenience, instrumentalizing, instrumentalizing them to manipulate entire cultures. This happens because our beliefs make us vulnerable. And we often fall into the trap of turning our beliefs into dogmas that make us feel safe and we cherish them as unquestionable acts of faith, often with terrible consequences. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for your attention. <clears throat> okay, let me let me on undo this sharing screen. Hi, Hi here I am. So you, I would like to have some feedback. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So it, it's been a, a fascinating presentation. So many possibilities, so many, uh, so much um, wealth of meaning. You no, know? there, there are multiple uh, ways of, of looking at this. So first of all, congratulations, because it, it is undoubtedly a fascinating topic and, and very uh, surprising for, for those of us who are not familiar with this symbolism. Uh, and also very, very pleasing to hear this on International Women's Day. You know? So um, first of all, I would like to say that. And then, of course, um, I would like to invite the audience to make questions, uh, either in English or in Spanish, uh, uh, as you please. And um, if anyone needs translation, we can do that as well. 
um, but it's it it is truly great. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank well, you. One of the things that, that strikes me is the possibility of overlapping the the delicate soft butterfly with the hardness of obsidian. No, uh, how how do you think this this came about? There is actually, I have an interpretation I made once a time. There is a German word for butterfly that is very violent because it's called schmetterling. <laughs> okay. And that means it has to do with, with the movement that the, the, the uh, wings make of, of the butterfly. Okay. And it's a very possible that it is a metaphor for war. It is the obsidian knives fighting against each other when you are uh, on the on the, on the field of uh, on a battlefield, and uh, that is also very disturbing, because it's a butterfly that cuts, mm -hmm. that lacerates. Yeah, it has many many different kinds of interpretation. Yeah, yeah, but actually, uh, stone for us is like very heavy because we have this idea of of Peter being. The, the the rock or the stone where you have to put your faith. And uh, obsidian is not a heavy stone. It's more like a glass stone. And it's fragile. And it's sharp. Yeah. Thank you. Also very striking is the, the visual representation of this as a skirt of bloody knives. No? Yeah. Uh, it, it it was inevitably to me it was reminiscent of um, some uh, professor in in the sixties a feminist professor in the sixties or seventies I'm not sure which who made a skirt this was in Berkeley when one of the most sort of progressive uh, universities no? um, she went to one of her lectures dressed with a skirt made out of uh, neckties. Oh. Of, of masculine neckties, no? so this was, yeah. in, uh, and it is surprising that it is so so very old, no? such a such a um, compelling representation uh, of of uh, this feminine entity with something that we might associate with masculinity. You know? I, I I find that yeah. very we don't simple. have like a determined masculine or feminine uh, oh. principle. Which is like, for us, it's like strange because we need one, as I said, like the Aristotelic one <laughs> to have a reference. Mm -hmm. But they did not. They had this void or this uh, hollow space where everything is possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Ivan has written in the chat, thank you so much for the presentation. It was really interesting. I agree. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and yes, this... The images you have shown us uh, of the um, of these bowls as well, no, uh, I think they're they're also very very significant, very yeah. familiar to, <clears throat> to everyday everyday use, no? and and still carrying great symbolism. Yeah, I just want to strike something uh, out. We have to be very careful with these images. We have to be, be, be very careful with symbols because they do uh, create our reality, but you cannot go back from reality to symbolism. Reality does not create, create the symbols. And so we have to be very careful not to dogmatize them because otherwise we, we can end up in beliefs that are like the Aztecs, uh, very, very painful and very cruel. Yes, I was thinking precisely of that, of the, um, when the encounter with European or Western cultures came about, um, the, some pre-Hispanic cultures were very quickly demonized, um, regardless of the fact that those Western cultures had some equally abhorrent practices, no? except uh, in a greater number and without the, the symbolism. So, so um, it, it is a bit of a... There is a very curious thing because uh, as we have, and uh, we start from zero, we don't start from one. 
Okay, it, it can be very inclusive. I don't think the Aztecs or any other culture would have had a problem of including Jesus Christ in one of the sacrificial ceremonies they did anyway. But it's not so the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> they felt terribly threatened. Mm -hmm. They felt terribly threatened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's that's okay. someone is is worth talking. Yes. Is Federico? Yeah. We had a comment, but uh, I, I think if you have questions, please write them to UNAM UK so that they can be uh, published okay. and everyone can see them. So if, if someone wrote directly to, to Monica, uh, please. Yeah. Uh, Federico yes. Mina, really nice. Uh -huh. Okay, and also I have one from Gabriela Porras. Gabriel, Gabriel, hello. Gabriel, Gabriel. sorry. Yes, yes, we're very happy to have him. Yeah, yeah. member of, of the Mexican community. So if you can repeat the questions and I will be glad to answer them. Gabriel dice, ¿podría la profesora comentar sobre la semejanza de Ispapalotl con la reina de la noche de la antigua Mesopotamia? This is very suggestive. Uh -huh. Puede sí. ser en español. Eh, Puede ser en español. Sí, este, las culturas mesopotámicas también, o sea, el problema con las culturas mesopotámicas es que ellas sí tienen este, estas ideas maniqueas. ¿no? del bien y el mal, y lo claro y el oscuro, y la reina de la noche es la reina de la noche. No puede transmutarse como con esta movilidad que tenemos en prehispánicos a cualquier, a cualquier figura que es, le venga en gana. ¿no? Que esa es como la problemática. ¿no? Si yo soy el jaguar y en la noche, fíjate que mejor me gustó más ponerme como Venus la estrella al amanecer, lo puedo hacer. Porque como soy una energía en potencia, ¿No? Yo puedo jugar con la iconografía. En Mesopotamia son muy fijos. Son muy fijas los, los significados. Por ejemplo, los eh, signos del zodiaco, que son mesopotámicos, y las este, figuras que, que vinculan a los prehispánicos a sus fechas de nacimiento, que también son como astrológicos, es mucho, es mucho más flexible la, la prehispánica. Okay. Suena, suena fascinante. Gabriel, sí. eh, a ver si, si después podemos saludar. Encantar. Ajá, sí, sí, sí. Perfecto. Sí. Federico Mina dice, I was thinking about the status of gods in Nahua cultures. They seem mm -hmm. transcendental enough as to be over our changes of time, different suns, and our social order. Women cannot be equal to men but also very close to what we see every day, masculine and feminine, butterflies, earth elements as subsidian. Do you think they were believed to be close to the human world or very far away? Gods, he refers to gods. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the fact that you cannot like rely on one special uh, image, yeah, that can be the place where you can worship and, and, and do things, makes it very difficult to relate to in, in daily life to the deities. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think they have uh, a big influence in daily life because of the ceremonies and that because of the calendars. But I don't think it was like a worshiping we would do with uh, with our like Christian saints or, or, or gods where we have like a specific image. Because you can invoke them just by one detail. Just by what, sorry? One detail, one detail. For oh, instance, okay. if I want to invoke uh, Ispa Pilot, I just need to have a sacrificial knife and there she is. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's like these parallel words that like uh, uh, finish the, the whole image. If you think of one hand in pre-Hispanic, uh, in, in prehistoric uh, caves, you have just the hand, but you know that hand belongs to the whole person. Mm -hmm. And the whole person is invoked just by the hand. Mm -hmm. So that's the importance of details and jewelry in pre-Hispanic America. Mm -hmm. One of the things I find more difficult is to interpret these images because they're saturated with details. Mm -hmm. There are so many details, and I guess this has to do with this dynamic quality that you're explaining, that, that they may have a little bit of this one, a little bit of that one. And yeah. so they, and they, kind of... they they make like nodes. 
yeah, mm -hmm. where they all come together. Mm -hmm. And then it's very difficult to know what is really at stake there. And after so much time, it's quite impossible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I also noticed that when one of the images, uh, when you showed us two, mm -hmm. one of the images had a straight uh, color in the skin and the other one was white and red, no? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. All of them have meanings. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh -huh. Gabriel dice que incluye una imagen, pero uh -huh. no, no, la, no la vemos. Uh -huh. Ah, aquí está, el relieve de él. La podemos ver en el chat. Uh -huh. Ok, déjame poner el chat. Perla Alicia, qué gusto. Um, Perla Alicia says, the navel of creation, does it resemble the vacuity in Buddhism? which contains everything that can be reflected, but holds nothing? Yes, okay. there is a similarity. But uh, the difference, we don't have this sunyata concept. It's not this vacuum where you get into paradise like forever, because mm -hmm. you have already overcome all the challenges of reincarnations. They don't have that. They want to keep it moving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And well, she was asking uh, about the obsidian knife. Mm -hmm. uh, well, is is Papa little is the knife right? So no. she is the knife. You can imagine like a big butterfly, like nursing all the knives. It's very terrifying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like opening it up, and you have all those knives coming out, and it means violence uh, to everyone. Okay, so it's it's very scary. Yeah. Uh, and it, this is also reminiscent of, of the goddess Kali, no? of, of the goddess Kali with, with a necklace made out of the skulls, the, the yeah. bodies that she has eaten. No? Yeah, but then it's the skull and it's, it's a life thing that already happened, but the knives is yeah. the potential way of, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's like the possibility of getting hurt. Mm -hmm. This That's, is also yeah. similar to we we uh, at the Royal Academy in London. We had a an incredible exhibit uh, of um, oh, Marina. Please help me. What's her name? Uh, the installation artist. Ah, um, es posible. Bueno, she mm -hmm. she's a very well known. Me voy a acordar ahorita el nombre. Si alguien me lo recuerda mejor. Uh, uh, she is from the former Yugoslavia, uh, mm -hmm. and um, she had um, one of the performances that, that were being enacted by some younger performers, which she had done many years ago, was recreated in, in this special exhibit at the Royal Academy, where they were supposed to spend, I think, two weeks in... Mm -hmm. Marina Abramovic, thank you very much, Carla. Exactly. Marina Abramovic, she's very, very well known. Um, and uh, the only way to access the, the place, the high, the elevated place where, mm -hmm. where this woman was, it was always a woman, was through some staircases, ladders, not staircases, but ladders. Mm -hmm. And the, the rungs of the ladders were knives. So if you put your foot in there, it would be cut. No, so there's there's this very very powerful um, aspect of, of the merely visual. No, you don't need to touch it. You know, you just need to see it, and that's that's you enough. You invoke you invoke this. You invoke pain. It's terrible. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. And Perla Alicia is asking, where can we consult more about the topic? Can you suggest a book, Dr. Monica? Well, there are a, a lot of, of, of books. I mentioned Loret Sejourné. I mentioned Mactos Montezuma. I mentioned like all the uh, classic in, in, in the chat box, Monica? What, because some of the names are... Yes, little... but I need, I don't have the, the oh, exact... No. 
Ah, we know Matos Moctezuma, but the other one you mentioned is a little bit harder. Maurel Sejourné, she's a French. Uh -huh. Let me put, let me the, see, I get the chat, and uh -huh. I can put at least the name because of, where is it? Now I can find my chat here. Participants, no. No, I can I cannot access notes or anything. But it's uh, called Loret Sejourni. Write to Angelica to Unam UK. Ajá. Le mandas mensaje a ella, ya se puede republicar. Sí, pero la cosa es que no encuentro ni ni cómo mandar mensaje. ¿Qué me pasa aquí? Espera. Bueno, no importa. <laughs> si no, no, después verla por correo. Después, no. si quieres, con todo gusto. Tengo la bibliografía en el texto que tenía en español, pero no lo tengo a la mano. Sí. Yo no te lo traduje y ya lo tenía en inglés. Sí, perdón. Sí. Está sí. también, obviamente, León Portilla, está este Ángel María Garibay, está, hay, hay muchos. Sí. También este Jacques Sustel tiene una, una, un, un texto también que se llama El universo de los aztecas, que también habla de eso. Uh -huh. No sé si alguien más quisiera hacer alguna pregunta. And thanks and regards. Thank you, Perla. Um, I, I would like to make a, a commentary about, you know how there is in some circles in Mexico, uh, a big revival of, of this kind of thing. No? Yeah. And, um, I was wondering of, of uh, something I have heard that people do. I, I don't know anyone who has actually done yeah. it, but that when uh, a child is born, yeah. I don't want the umbilical cord to be cut with scissors. But with an obsidian knife. Can you explain this and why it is so? Yeah. Scissors have a different symbolic in a different symbolical meaning. Mm -hmm. Okay, they are not portrayed as, as, as sons of the goddess of creation. <laughs> okay, and that's why. Mm -hmm. Actually, yeah. And usually they want to put it around the, around the tree, the umbilical cord or hang it from a tree or something. That is also a reference to Tam Wan Chan, which is like the, the pre-Hispanic Garden of Eden, of Eden, like the place of the unborn. Uh -huh. But as we think that we are expelled from paradise and that's a tragedy, they think it's great because it gives the possibility to enter life, which I find very beautiful. Yes, yes it is a, a beautiful interpretation. and yeah. Thank you very much, Gabriel. He wrote the name of, of the researcher, Loret Serrurne. Gracias, um, Gabriel. Sí. Perfecto. Um, ¿Alguien más? Bueno, voy a aprovechar para invitar, I want to invite everybody to uh, Dr. Monica Stenbock's uh, next talk. She's going to give two of us. We're very lucky on the 20th of March, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and a completely different topic for another one of her specialties. It, it's going to be about the Weimar Republic and uh, yeah, cabaret culture. It's going to be fantastic. Entonces, no se pierdan la siguiente conferencia. Eh, va a ser en español, ¿verdad? Acordamos que... Muchas aquellos... gracias, sí, porque no sabes cómo me costó Ajá. trabajo traducir esto al no, inglés. Eso bien, 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 Pero bueno. sí, sí se entendió muy bien, yo creo, ¿verdad? Sí. Qué bueno. Estoy sí, muy contenta. Sí. Muy bien, perfecto. Muy bien, pues muchísimas gracias, Mónica. Otra vez, felicidades. Estuvo sensacional. It was a sensational talk. Many thanks to all of you who have been here with us. We're very, very happy to, to see uh, uh, well-known names and not so well-known names. Uh, you're always, always welcome to, to our activities. Thank you, Ana. Uh, we're going to say goodbye for now and hopefully see you in our next uh, talk. Okay. Thank Thanks for everyone to, to listen and have a very happy Women's Day today. Yes. Excellent. You will. Okay. Thank you okay. okay. Goodbye. Thank you. Gracias. Muchísimas gracias, Gabriel. Qué, qué alegría verte por acá. Ay, sí. Y qué lindo que gracias. puso Lorenzo y Jornet que sí. estaba yo sacada de onda. Gracias. Hasta luego. Perla también y todos, bueno, todos los que están aquí. Muchísimas gracias. Nos despedimos. Gracias.
Hasta luego.